New York was built on the waterfront. It became an archipelago with five boroughs, five peninsulas linked by bridges over the Hudson, the East River, the ocean, the largest coastline of any metropolis. To fuel its growth, it has destroyed vast forests and contributed generously to global warming. New York has made too many mistakes against nature. Now it is being punished for its excesses. If the city is here because it's on the ocean, and then the ocean rises, then you see the city, the very thing that made the city could destroy the city. Breaking news. This storm is a rare and extreme event, a category one hurricane merging with an Arctic front. Irene, 2011, Sandy, 2012. The hurricanes hit more violently every time. You need to evacuate. Do not delay. Uh, this is a serious storm, and it potentially have fatal consequences if people have an act. 80 dead in 2012. The subway submerged, electricity cut off, $50 billion of damage, and mud clear up to the windows of Wall Street. And in the storm, New York paddles around in a panic. For the second time in its history, the megalopolis awakens with a weird sensation. Since September 11th, it knew it was vulnerable to men. Now, faced with the elements, it feels fragile. New York's Parks Commissioner reckons this is just the start. We are in grave danger from rising sea level. As storms increase in intensity, as we, get we have had hurricanes and tornadoes in New York, over the last few years that we haven't seen before. If the sea level rises another foot in the next 100 years, that will all be underwater. To Hollywood, it was just another disaster movie scenario. To New Yorkers, even smarter, it was reality. New York City could be swept away at any moment by the very thing that created it, water. Now, New York City has no choice. It's either rethink or drown. But how? The finest architects brought together by MoMA in the Rising Currents Group are seeking a lifesaver. They all agree on one point. To survive, New York must make its peace with nature and make a new alliance with water. In his agency in Tribeca, Adam Yurinsky is at the forefront of this thinking. It was a wake up call for the city. In New York City, the storm surge would enter the harbor through the Verrazano Narrows, and anything in the path of that would be subject to the lateral force of a storm surge of a wave, basically a large wave. So the islands that we created create a buffer zone which can help dampen the force of a wave. Nature is a source of inspiration to us in terms of resilience. Making reefs to slow down waves, opening urban estuaries which let water into selected spots in Manhattan. Architects dream of recreating a natural ecosystem to stop the floods. Within the city, Yurinsky dreams up mechanisms and materials which absorb a maximum amount of water, storing it like a sponge in water parks and discharging it as late as possible as the soil would do naturally. Since New Orleans, town planners have seen that levees, however high they are, always give way. There is a before and after Katrina in how we approach cities. New York must work in harmony with water. Together, they must form a single organism. That's Yurinsky's message. Other visionaries go even further in coming to the city's help. Landscaper Kate Orff wants to use the most humble of animals. Can the oyster save New York? Our goal is really to kind of harness the biological processes and the biological power of the oyster itself to create not only new sort of physical urban fabrics, but also to um, uh, reconnect New Yorkers with their harbor. The oyster is this amazing animal that essentially can help us address uh, water quality through its biofiltration processes. Um, it can address 
storm surge through agglomerating into reef structures and attenuating waves. Um, and it also can address sea level rise in that um, it, it, cleaner water and, uh, and slower water mean that you can essentially reset your relationship with that water. By reconnecting with nature, today anything is on the agenda. If a shellfish can spell salvation, then it's up for consideration. In the 19th century, more than a half a million acres of oyster reefs would protect and feed the city, then nicknamed Oyster City. But who remembers that? New York's reinvention should begin with finding out about and understanding its natural history. Some answers lie behind the scenes at the Bronx Zoo. The Bronx Zoo is the refuge of Eric Sanderson, a scientist who has devoted his life to rebuilding the natural history of Manhattan, a Lenape name for Island of Many Hills. Why did the pioneers of New York City settle here at the water's edge 400 years ago? Quite simply, because it was a natural paradise. Sanderson had that intuition before he came up with the proof. I happened to be in a, a large bookstore downtown, and I saw this map. Um, from 200 years ago called the British Headquarters map. And it showed all of the original streams and hills of Manhattan. Well, so I, I tried to imagine if I was an ecologist and I was riding on Henry Hudson's ship, what might I have seen in Manhattan? And what I, what I would have seen is this, is this amazing deep water harbor and this long, thin wooded island that was Manhattan Island, uh, covered with forest and fringed with beaches, with sparkling streams coming down to the shoreline. Manhattan, 400 years ago, was a complete ecological system. It had bears, it had people, it had whales, it had porpoises, it had river otters. It had something that we don't have anywhere in the world today, which is a complete ecological system with all the parts working together to satisfy each other and be part of the ecology of the place. The modern city raised Manhattan's 35 hills to the ground then stretched out over the sea, over its own rubble. It offered itself up to flooding, forgetting its geography at the risk of ending its history. It was in the midst of such wealth that pioneers laid the foundations of the global city. But how, in just a few centuries, were these virtually virgin forests, this wild natural landscape, turned into a forest of glass and concrete? First, they had to eliminate the inhabitants, the Lenape Indians. The natural resources were so abundant that they knew neither hierarchy nor mistrust. They taught nature and hunting techniques to the settlers who then killed them. The pioneers then began intensively hunting beavers. A single boat could carry up to 7,000 pelts to Holland, a natural treasure that helped the city in its rise. Then the settlers had an extraordinary idea to turn Manhattan, the island with 35 hills, into a geometrical shape, to deny nature, to crush it in order to develop the city in nothing but the city, according to a grid with every last piece chopped up and sold. One of the distinctive characteristics of New York is its grid, what we would call a waffle iron. This grid was so important because it was imposing man on nature. It was saying that with all these trees and hills and streams, we're gonna to try to make it flat and we're gonna develop it. In order to develop it, we've gotta lay out streets. And in order to sell the property, because New York was always about making money, we will create streets exactly 200 feet apart. There is an irony here in the sense that nature created the conditions for New York to exist and then New York, in some sense, in its physical growth, turns against nature to build up all these buildings and tries to forget about it. 150 years later, the famous grid has left its mark on New York like a waffle iron. The forests seem to have given up the ghost, and the city reigns supreme. So what's left of nature? How might it still count in the fate of the Big Apple?
David Roseanne is a pioneer of urban ecology, teacher at Cornell University, an ornithologist. He's one of those who opens nature up to New Yorkers. To him, nature is still alive and kicking. Just look into the air. Each year, the birds return in their thousands, and each year, they pay the price. New York is built right in the middle of a migration route. Oh dear. This bird is, is called a scarlet tanager. It's a South American bird that flies north every spring. The sad thing is you really have to imagine what these birds are going through. Just surviving uh, in the natural environment, in the wilderness, in the rainforest where they spend the winter, um, in the temperate forest where they breed, trying to evade predators, trying to raise their young, flying thousands and thousands of kilometers to get this far north and thousands and thousands of kilometers to fly south again and then slamming into a building. And so this is a, you know, you, this is my favorite bird. So it's to find a dead one sucks. Fucking windows. The New York City was built in the middle of this flyway. And most of the buildings around here have reflective uh, glass, and the birds, the migratory birds at least, the local birds, the starlings, the pigeons, the house sparrows, they figure that out. But the migratory birds really can't perceive glass as such, and they see a reflection of a tree behind them in the window that they're flying into as a tree that they could potentially land on. And before you know it, before they know it, they hit the glass, they're dead. In spring and in autumn, the radars ping like crazy revealing a million passing migrants in the New York City skies. Fooled by the lights or the reflections, 90,000 birds die on the skyscrapers. Nowadays, the buildings are clad in anti-glare glass, and the most powerful city in the world dims its lights several nights a year. The giant decoy is turned off to let a few flights of birds passed from Amazonia from Canada and from the dawn of time. <laughs> 